Jesus, I surrender all to Him I freely give. I would ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender few pages down. Nearer, still nearer. Number 539. Yeah. 
Good evening, everybody. All right, who got a nap this afternoon? Anybody? All right. Just thought I'd ask. <laughs> I did. Well, welcome to any visitors we have here tonight. Good to see many people out. In just a moment, we'll be hearing again from Larry Price, and uh, I get to be in here for this one. Looking forward to it. So um, the ministries are beginning again, children's ministries, uh, Tuesdays beginning September 12th. Uh, so it's still a little bit out, but be, be praying for the Boys Brigade group, Girls TNT, the leadership, the kids that are coming and everything. And as well, Awana begins up se on September 21st. So let's hope for a nice big turnout, that there's enough leaders, and uh, that they're prepared to do the Lord's work again for another, another year. Wednesday nights, prayer and Bible study at 7.15 right here. As usual, we're in the, uh, still in the book of 1 John, chapter 2. And then other upcoming events, uh, the last Quakes Baseball Chapel outing, those are always a ton of fun, is this Tuesday, September 5th, so out in Rancho, get your tickets ahead of time online, and see Gary Aarons for more details. Gary, does the game start at 6.30? Is that right? Okay, 6.30, get there about 6, or whenever you need to get there, if you want to see the first pitch or not. Anyway, uh, Chapel Potluck, September 24th, 12 noon, right after the Family Bible Hour, and the theme is Italian, so um, and look forward to that. Uh, Ladies' Night of Prayer on September 29th at 7 p.m., and it'll be at uh, Ina's Pool Clubhouse in Whittier. Uh, address is here in the bulletin. And then sign up in the foyer so they know how many to expect. But see Nari Yoon or Jen Chance for more information on that. Uh, October 14th, coming up Saturday, still a little ways out, but Saturday, October 14th is the Father-Son Team Day, Verdugo Pines Bible Camp. Uh, see Andrew here for more details. Andrew, do they have a 5K run with Father and Son for that or...? Not quite. Okay. Uh, anyway, um, October 28th, the Claremont Village Venture Street Fair. We've gone to it for a lot of years. We need help there, as always, so sign up in the foyer for that so we know how many to expect. Even if you can commit half an hour or an hour, um, hopefully as much as possible on that day, do sign up, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a team effort that day, so um, sign up if you, if you can possibly make it. Anything else? Okay, I've asked uh, Desmond to come up and open us in prayer. All right, let's open our meeting with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for uh, the opportunity we have this evening uh, to come here to worship you, Lord, uh, to learn more about your son. Uh, we lift up Larry as he brings us the word this evening, Lord. Uh, we just ask that we would have uh, receptive hearts, Lord, as, as, we, uh, as we listen, as we go about the rest of our night uh, and the rest of our, our uh, week, Lord. We just ask that we could be uh, strive to be more like you and more like your son uh, as we uh, as we just go about um, the rest of our week and even the rest of this uh, upcoming school year, Lord, as, as ministries pick up, we just thank you for the opportunities we have uh, to share the gospel, whether it's at the street fair uh, or at Awana. Uh, and we just ask for uh, strength and boldness as we do that, Lord. Uh, we once again thank you for this, uh, this evening that we have and, and for our fellowship that we, uh, we can enjoy together. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Buy that number by about a thousand, Jeff, and that's that's what you can expect up there. All right, number five forty-eight for our next hymn: "Take My Life and Let It Be." Number five forty-eight. <clears throat> Take my life and let it be.
will be number 565, Seeking the Loss, number 565. Thank you, Andrew. Let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew one more time. Thank you again for the opportunity of being with you folks. It's a more, much more abbreviated trip than normally due to other responsibilities that I had and other things I had prior to this that I couldn't uh, change. So, though it's a short visit, grateful to be able to be with you and to open God's Word. We're going to look into, <clears throat> excuse me, Matthew chapter 13. And I'll begin by reading in verse 1. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 1. The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. And great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship or a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the way, by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, because they had no root. They withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, and some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? 
He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given. He shall have more abundance, but whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they, seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed or grown calloused, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. And so the Lord begins to explain to them and define to them what he was saying in the particular parable that he gave. Now, I'm not going to go over the structure and arrangement of Matthew's gospel. I've done that a couple of times, albeit brief, enough to establish the pattern to show you that as Matthew's material uh, is presented, there are narrative sections that have historical accounts, movement, and lots of stuff going on, lots of action, and then other times which are more formal teaching where there is no movement, he primarily is in one place, and he gives different lengths of discourse, some rather lengthy, like chapters 5 through 7, some uh, just one chapter, and actually chapter 13 here is a very lengthy chapter as well. But we want to look tonight at one of the teaching sections. We've primarily been looking both with the men at the conference and with you folks here at the narrative sections of chapter 8 and chapter 9, and then this morning the narrative chapter, narrative section in chapter 11. But in doing so, in this particular section of Matthew's gospel, ultimately we're going to come to that, that ultimate question that is asked in chapter 16, whom do men say that I am? We noticed this morning in chapter 11 that that's, that question was broached a bit by John, when he said, are you the one? You'll find further mention of a similar phrase, is not this? The question of the identity of Jesus Christ. And the leading theme in that section has to do with evidences that Jesus Christ is indeed the Messiah. And as I pointed out this morning, along with that in this section, there is the theme of judgment. Here are some of the verses where we find those uh, passages that the Lord brings forth, the the fact of the judgment that will occur upon those who reject the evidence. It's a beautiful thing to think that God takes into account the amount of evidence an individual has. Whether or not they have evidence or not, all of that comes into play when God performs that work of which the Old Testament says is his strange work of judgment, not a work that he delights to perform. And so the theme of judgment. And then uh, when we think of these two things, evidence and judgment. What does one do with the evidence? When you come to analyze the gospel of Jesus Christ, and Paul unfolds it for us in that, what I consider to be that masterful book, the book of Romans, you find him in the first chapter talking about evidence, that that which may be known of him is clearly seen by the things that he's created, so that even his eternal power and Godhead are evidenced by the things that are made. You'll find him saying there that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven 
against men, human beings, who have suppressed the evidence. They have suppressed the evidence. In a court of law, that is a serious violation. In a case of, of, of law, for someone to suppress the evidence. But that is what humanity has done, which indicates to us very clearly it is not because people can't know. It's because they take that which they do know and seek to suppress it or hold it down. And that adds further to judgment. And so when we think in this section of uh, Matthew's gospel, as I mentioned this morning, the preaching of John was that the axe was laid to the root of the tree, but he was now in prison, and where was the judgment that was promised to come? Where was the righteousness? What would happen to the kingdom? And the more I study Matthew's gospel the more it seems to me that when we begin to get to the central section of Matthew's gospel, particularly chapter 13, that Matthew's initial target audience, which would have been Jewish people, would have had to know the answer of what had happened to the program that God had promised. There is no question but when one reads the Old Testament that God promised a golden age upon this earth. A time when Israel as a nation would be exalted. A time when righteousness would prevail over the face of the earth. Wickedness and evil would be judged. And the kingdom would be brought in. What happened to that program? Now there are a number of things that you could do to try to come to grips with that particular question. What a vast number of Christian folks have done, and I don't doubt at all the reality of their salvation, and the depth of their sincerity and love for the Lord, what a vast majority of those who are Christians have done is to take those sections that deal with Israel as a nation and say that those no longer apply to the nation of Israel. And replacement theology says that the church has replaced Israel and that all of the promises that were made to Israel as a nation and a future literal, as they would call it, a carnal kingdom, that means an earthly or fleshly kingdom upon earth, is not to be realized in a future day, that whatever kingdom there is is realized in the church in the day and age in which we live. And if you find that difficult to swallow, I say praise the Lord. (laughs) you've been well taught. And you've been well taught not just because of what some folks in the 1800s thought up or what Cyrus Ingress Schofield put down in his Bible. You've been well taught that when one reads the scripture, if you want the technical phrase, one looks for what is called authorial intent. What was the intention of the author when he wrote And what would the basic understanding be when you and I read it? In other words, the face value literalacy of the scripture. If you want it put in a more uh, layman kind of a way, which appeals a lot to me, I go back to the little principle that I learned very early on that says, when the plain sense of scripture makes good sense, seek no other sense, lest it become nonsense. And so when you come to Matthew chapter 10, which we didn't look at this morning, but I'll give you one example of how this works, and you find the Lord Jesus there commissioning his disciples and giving them instructions as to what they were to do and where they were to go. He says specifically to them, do not go to the Gentiles. Do not go to the Samaritans. Go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now you either take that to mean that what he was saying was, go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, or 
you have to do some hermeneutical gymnastics and say, well, what he was saying there, you see, was the lost sheep of Israel. That meant uh, go only to the elect. And so he, they were only to go to the elect, as if the elect had some sort of neon flashing sign around them or something so that they could know the difference. No. But then when you couple that with the fact that that same gospel, this same gospel in the end, finds us hearing the Lord Jesus say in what we refer to as the Great Commission, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Well, at the least you'd have to say there certainly was between chapter 10 and 28 a change in the program. So I, I just bring that to your attention to to say that we have to come to the consideration, and, and I get back to what I was getting at, that Matthew's initial target audience being Jewish people would, would want to know what has become of the program. And I think it is that, that for that reason that Matthew constructs his gospel in such a way under inspiration of the Spirit of God to show us what that program is doing in this day and age. And so we come to Matthew chapter 13, and we have the, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 13 will describe the general characteristics of what is called the inter-advent period, beginning with the time when the Lord Jesus was on earth and continuing until his return at the end of the age. A very simple breakdown. In parables 1 through 4, you have the program of God attacked, and then in parables 5 through 7, you have the program of God accomplished. Matthew stands at the gateway to the New Testament. And understanding Matthew's gospel really enables us to get a better grasp of the whole New Testament. Matthew obviously is very Jewish and the most dispensational. And when I say that word unapologetically... By dispensational, I mean that uh, the approach that he takes very clearly indicates the distinction in this age of the program that God has as opposed to the last age and the last program. Now, understanding dispensationalism and that approach to Scripture is exceedingly helpful to get in a grasp on the whole of the Word of God. And here's part of the difficulty. The Bible is not a book that gives us the history of the world. It tells us about the creation of the world. But its primary focus is not the history of the world. The Bible is the history of the Jewish people and Jewish nation. And so you find actually extremely brief comment and material on the creation of the world, which is given to us in just a very short chapter or two in the book of Genesis. And things move fairly rapidly to chapter 12, when God segments off for him a, a rivulet from the river of humanity and calls a man named Abram out of what we would call today modern-day Iraq, the land of the Tigris and the Euphrates, and brings him over into a land that he's promised to give to him and makes of that man ultimately a nation of people. And so from Genesis chapter 12 to Calvary and into the early chapters of the book of Acts, all that bulk of material has to do with the nation of Israel. And from Exodus chapter 19 where the Israelites enter into a covenant relationship with God known as the Mosaic Covenant or the Covenant of the Law. They are governed under that covenant until the time when Christ died on the cross. And even after that, as we sometimes say, it took them a while to wade out of the mud. And they still had some of it stuck to them. It didn't all happen at once. And so you're way up into the 15th chapter of the book of Acts and they're still discussing whether or not people ought to be circumcised according to the law of Moses and keep the law. 
So it was transitional. It didn't happen immediately. And that's not, that's fairly understandable since it had been immersed for all those thousands of years and, well, all those centuries at least, uh, in the Jewish nation and culture. And so the break that came. Now we notice in the Gospel of Matthew a key turning point, and that climactic turning point takes place in chapter 12, and let me read those two verses for you in verse 31 and verse 32. There are three times, once uh, prior to, two times prior to this, where one time the Jews accused the Lord Jesus of doing what he did under the power of Satan. Another time when the Lord himself says that they had accused him that way. And finally, you come to this part, to where he says in verse 31, I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever shall speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whosoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world neither in the world to come. The blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now let me just briefly say a couple of things about that. This has been a passage of scripture and a phrase that has troubled many people. The first thing I'll say about it is this. If you're concerned that you've committed the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, well, take heart, you haven't. If you're concerned that you've done that, you haven't. Because the way that that happens is not from someone casually hearing about the gospel and then uh, not making a decision or something like that. You've got to see it in the context of Matthew, that here was the very Son of God himself, performing things that were so miraculous that the crowd began to say, this has to be of God. And the Pharisees rejecting and rejecting and rejecting and rejecting until their hearts became, in the words of Matthew 13, waxed calloused. And a callous, anybody who works with their hands knows, is not a blister. A blister comes up immediately. A callous is built up over time. Show me anybody that says they play the guitar, and I can tell you how much they do by simply feeling the tips of their fingers to see if they're calloused. It's one of the problems in playing the guitar. People say, oh, I'd love to play the guitar, and then you press the strings, you go, ooh, that hurts. You know, it's not like piano in that sense, because you have to press those metal strings. And so this was a time when the Pharisees had and those who would be, could be guilty of this had seen the living Son of God in the flesh performing these things in front of their very eyes. There's that classic passage that takes place in John's Gospel after, the res, after Lazarus is raised from the dead. And you, could, you sort of scratch your head and say, huh? You know, they're discussing, well, what, was, what should we do? Because this thing is known. I know we'll kill him. What? <laughs> I mean, it's in this chapter that after the performance of all of these different miracles, that the scribes and the Pharisees came and said, uh, we would like to see a sign from you. What? You've seen sign after sign after sign after sign to which he says, no sign will be given to this evil and adulterous generation, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. So chapter 12 has moved us to this climactic time in the life and ministry of the teaching of the Lord Jesus and this rejection that takes place by the leaders of the nation, causing him then to turn. And the very next thing that takes place is the introduction of the mysteries, the parables of the mysteries of the kingdom. He goes out of the house, he sits by the sea. I don't want to make too much of it except to say that there is plenty of scriptural basis to see the sea in many places indicating the nations of the world. 
not only in passages such as Isaiah 57, the wicked are like the troubled sea, which cast up mire and dirt, and so on, but in, pa in passages such as you find in the book of Daniel, where those Gentile forms of power and government rise up out of the sea. But be that as it may, he distances himself in a sense from Israel, and he begins to speak to them in parables. And the purpose of the parables, he explains himself, was both to reveal and to conceal. To conceal from those who weren't really interested, but to reveal to those who were. And I say it's a wonderful thing for you and me. I don't know how, how we take it for granted, and I say we, I should say me, of the wonderful fact that you and I, who are believers in Christ, have seen that which the prophets longed to see down through all those ages. We have seen the fulfillment of God's word in the coming of the Messiah. We have seen what took place on Calvary. Not that we were there physically, of course, but we've come to believe in that one who is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And we've entered into the reality, and, and God has opened our eyes. And it's why so many people, when they get saved, it's like a light came on. And I can remember myself trying occasionally to read the Bible, and it was just like, it might as well have been Hebrew or Greek or ancient Sumerian or something to me. It was a closed book, except for surface-level stuff. And I'll never forget the first thing that happened when I got saved and I began to read that little New Testament that was given to me. I'm like, this stuff's starting to make sense. I knew there was a lot I didn't know, but it wasn't a closed book anymore. And I could see things there. And I knew that it was true and that it was God's word. Remarkable. Now, we want to think about Matthew's use of kingdom of heaven as opposed to the kingdom of God, although sometimes the terms are used interchangeably. This passage of scripture is the first passage of scripture that helped me to understand something that I heard and never did get. So sometimes people use expressions, and you don't really understand what it means. So you ever hear the expression, can't see the forest for the trees? I never understood that. I'm like, what do you mean you can't see the forest for the trees? The forest is trees. How can you not see the forest for the trees when the forest is trees? But it was in this passage of scripture that I came to understand what that expression means. Because when I first got saved, as I mentioned earlier, I was dumb as a brick spiritually. And again, some people think I was dumb as a brick in many other ways, but be that as it may. And I struggled like crazy. I mean, I literally, I knew no other way to study Scripture but to read it and read it and read it and read it and get on my knees and pray and ask God to show me. And oftentimes I still came away with not getting it. At one time I had on my bookshelf probably 20 volumes, everything from pamphlets to bigger books, with titles such as The Kingdom of Heaven versus The Kingdom of God, and what the difference is between The Kingdom of Heaven and The Kingdom of God. And after reading all of them, I still felt like I didn't get it. There was something that just wasn't clicking. A lot of good stuff in there, but things that weren't clicking. And so when you begin to put the scriptures together, you find that although uh, Matthew will use this term, uh, kingdom of heaven, you also find that this term kingdom of God is used by Mark to speak of some of these same parables. And it's used by Luke to speak of some of the same parables. The true and the false together, the parable of the soils, the parable of the wheat and tares, the parable of the dragnet. And, and so it goes when you do your comparison. Exclusively used of Matthew, kingdom of heaven. But some of the same parables, identical, will use the expression 
kingdom of God. So that in, enough, in itself wasn't a help to me to say, well, Matthew uses it only to explain this. Well, wait a minute, Mark and Luke use kingdom of God to explain the same thing. So that wasn't as much of a help to me. What helped me was to see the connection between Matthew's use of kingdom of heaven and the Daniel messianic connection. So as I'm reading the book of Daniel years ago, I find expressions in there such as this, in chapter 2, which is Daniel, and it's a remarkable thing to think, isn't it, that the whole program of the kingdom was given in a dream, but not to Daniel, to a Gentile king, Nebuchadnezzar. And in that interpretation that Daniel gives to Nebuchadnezzar, which God gave to him, he says, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom. And there you have coupled together that expression, though worded a bit differently, the kingdom of heaven, the God of heaven setting up a kingdom. And then I thought about the fact that when you come to those books of the exile and the post-exilic books, such as uh, Daniel and Esther, uh, Esther, of course, where the name of God is not mentioned, but he's visibly working behind the scenes, or apparently working behind the scenes, evidently working behind the scenes. And then you have the fact that what had happened at this period was a very literal thing that Ezekiel describes as the glory of God beginning to move out from the temple. Not immediate, but in stages. And it moves to a certain place, and a certain place, and a certain place, and then it moves out over across the mountains. The departure of the Shekinah glory that God had, in a sense, removed himself from that people so that he becomes referred to in those books as the God of heaven, not just because he's the God who lives in heaven, but because now he is the God who has removed himself to heaven. Whereas he had physically dwelt among that nation of Israel. And that was a very important concept to get hold of. God has always had a kingdom. It has just been mediated in various forms. The mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. What is it and what it isn't? What it isn't. It's not just the thousand year kingdom. That was no mystery. There was no mystery to the fact that one day God would establish his kingdom on earth. The very prophecy of Daniel tells us that in chapter 2 and elsewhere. Now the period of time wasn't revealed until we get to the book of the Revelation, where it's mentioned six times there in chapter 20. But the very kingdom, the messianic kingdom coming to earth, that was not a mystery. It's not the spiritual kingdom, for that's only entered by the new birth. And you find in these parables that this form of the kingdom of heaven has both true believers and those who are not true believers. It's not the eternal kingdom because it exists on the planet. And it's not the church because it's more extensive than that. It began from the time the sower went forth to sow when the Lord Jesus was performing his ministry on planet earth and will end when he returns. So it's broader than just the church. A mystery is something that previously had not been revealed. An unrevealed truth concerning the kingdom of heaven. It was no mystery that one day the God of heaven would set up a kingdom that would never be destroyed, Daniel 2 and 44. A mystery that the one in whom the kingdom to be real, would be realized would be presented, rejected, and an entire age fall between this rejection and the ultimate fulfillment of God's purpose to bring the kingdom in upon earth. And the mystery that the evil would be allowed to continue, as we find in this chapter. And to me, that was one of the most 
remarkable things that he says to his disciples in these parables three times. You remember the parable of the wheat and the tares? And then they went out and they saw the wheat, they saw the tares, and they couldn't tell the difference between the two. One was good, one was bad, to which the Lord gives the ultimate uh, uh, explanation and exposition to leave it alone. Don't try to root up the evil. Let it grow. And twice, other time, two other times in the chapter will say, when the angels come at the end of the age, they will sever the just from the unjust. They'll take care of it. To the disciples, in that day, a form of the kingdom in which evil was allowed to continue was a complete mystery. It was unknown to them. And it couldn't be known because it had not been previously revealed that the kingdom would take this form and would exist for this length of time. An age that we're living in, imagine this. What did they know of a kingdom with an absent king? What kind of kingdom is that? There's no kingdom on earth that has the king gone. This would be an age in which the kingdom would exist in a form with an absent king. That this kingdom would be a sphere of profession. There'd be some that were true believers. There'd be some that were claiming to believers, to be believers, but wouldn't be genuine. It's one of the significant themes of Matthew 13, and many Christians fail to see it. And our Lord, Lord taught it, so we wouldn't, shouldn't be uh, surprised by it. A kingdom with an absent king. A kingdom in which evil is allowed to continue. A kingdom where God's plan is attacked. A kingdom where the enemy is allowed to operate. Who's ever heard of a kingdom like that? You, you take over a country as a king and... One of the first things you do is you get rid of your enemies. This form of the kingdom would be a form of the kingdom in which Satan would be allowed to operate. And so you begin to see why this was completely foreign to the concept of the kingdom of the disciples and to the Jewish people in general. And they would need to know about the plan. And so when we think of this kingdom and what it is. To put it rather briefly, it's not a time for the sword. It's a time for the seed. It wasn't a time for the disciples to pick up the sword and bring in the kingdom. And this is where the church has often gotten it wrong and, and ended up being like what Jacob said to his boys, you know, that time when they went into the city because of what had been done to their sister. And they did that act that they did, to which Jacob said, you have made me to stink among the inhabitants of the land. And the church, not understanding the distinction between the church and Israel and the what form of the program existed, has down through the centuries done tremendous harm to the testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ by not getting this right. Some of you are old enough to remember when I first got saved, it wasn't too long before I heard of a missionary group called International Crusade. And you remember International Crusade? Well, it wasn't too long until they had to change their name. They changed their name to International Teams. You go to a Muslim country and say, we're having a gospel crusade. They'll say, no, thank you. We've had those before. And many of our ancestors were beheaded in the name of Jesus Christ. Wrongfully so. That's why this is important. That's why this is critical and crucial to see. The distinction between the program that God has established now 
and what he did in the Old Testament and what he'll do in the future. And God has called us to sow the seed of the word of God. When I worked in Christian radio, we had a logo. Our station was called Way Radio, W-A-Y-R. And uh, on all of our literature and our letterhead, we had a logo. And the logo was of the sower. Now, sowing is a concept that perhaps needs definition today to some folks because it isn't, uh, you know, sew a needle and a thread. Sowing is the scattering and planting of seed. And old timers had a, had a word that they used for doing that. And so our logo had, a, had a, ma a figure of a man with a bag slung over his shoulder, sort of a Johnny Appleseed looking character, and he's reaching in the bag to get the seed to broadcast it. And that's where you get your term broadcast from. And what we were doing with the radio was broadcasting the seed of the word of God. And that's what we're to do. And you know what? From the time the Lord Jesus was on earth, it's remarkable to think that in that first initial parable he gives, only 25% of the seed produced fruit. So I think to myself, who am I to think I'm going to get 100%? <laughs> if only 25% when the Lord did it. Now, it's not all about the stats and the percentages, except to say God hasn't called us to produce results. That's not our job. He's called us to sow the seed, to spread the word. He'll do the results. He'll cause the fruit to grow. One plants, another waters. It's God who gives the increase. So let's understand our basic function in this age, to spread the seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God will do the work. Father, we trust that tonight wouldn't just be information overload. Sometimes these things are a lot to take in. But that we'd have a better understanding of Matthew's gospel, a better understanding of what we are to be about in this age. You haven't called us to root up unrighteousness in the world. Every Christian has a nature that is repelled by unrighteousness. And we wish we could get rid of it because that's the nature that you've implanted within us, like your own. But it's not our job to change the world. It's not our job to clean up the fishbowl. It's our job to catch fish. And so help us to understand it and to do it. And we give you thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.